Well, moving swiftly on, then, it appears that there's no public waiting to come in, although we were advised that there would be a lot of people wishing to come. So, the next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 15046 in the name of John Wilson on Syrian airstrikes. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I'd invite those members who wish to take part in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Mr Wilson to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'd like to firstly draw members to attention to my register of interests. I'd like to thank those members who signed this motion to allow us to have this debate this afternoon, uh, because clearly that demonstrates the desire that this Parliament debate issues of such serious consequence to Scotland and to the world. The United Nations Resolution 22489 has been cited as a basis for launching airstrikes in Syria. While it is true that the resolution calls for member states to use all necessary measures in the fight against Daesh, it goes on to say that such methods should be used in compliance with international law, in particular with the United Nations Charter, as well as international human rights, refugee and humanitarian law. It is difficult to see how bombing densely populated areas packed with civilians achieves this. In fact, the UK Secretary of State for Defence has stated that civilian casualties are inevitable. While this week Common Space reported the MOD as saying in terms of the identity of those killed in bombing raids, the MOD concedes that this was not information we hold readily. Presiding officer, the MOD has absolutely no idea who our bombs are hitting. The UN resolution further states that the situation will continue to deteriorate further in the absence of a political solution to the Syrian conflict. This part of the resolution should have been embraced fully and further efforts to progress the Vienna peace talks should have been made. While it is clear that those talks lacked a crucial dimension, no Syrians were involved. They were, however, clearly a positive first step at bringing together regional and global powers and an attempt to find a diplomatic solution to some of the issues facing Syria. I hope we continue to see further progress through this process, including the involvement of groups in Syria. It is impossible to see how a final solution to this situation without their involvement. The UN resolution also calls on member states to prevent and suppress the financing of terrorism. It is simply implausible that an international coalition, including the UK and the USA, with the backing of the UN, has exhausted all available avenues in this regard. It appears that maintaining good relations with Saudi Arabia, a state which operates in a strikingly similar manner to Daesh in its approach to criminal justice, is more valuable than cracking down on its financing of terrorist organisations. Also, the continued airstrikes by Saudi Arabia in Yemen is highlighted at the Amnesty International event held in this parliament last week. Presiding officer, the idea that further bombing in the Middle East can bring about a peaceful so resolution to the situation in Syria and elsewhere is utter nonsense. If bombing really worked as suggested, Iraq and Syria would be among the most peaceful countries in the world. They have been repeatedly bombed, cities have been destroyed, countless civilians have died, yet we are told the threat from terrorism is bigger today than it has ever been. Syria has been on the receiving end of airstrikes from a long list of countries, over 15 months of bombing, with an estimated 30,000 bombs being dropped. It is delusional to think that dropping more bombs in Syria will lead to a peaceful resolution to the current situation. Take a brief intervention. Elaine Smith. Many thanks uh, for Mr Wilson taking the intervention. I wondered if you would just uh, confirm, though, for the Chamber that those of us who disagreed with bombing, that, that that was not a position of do nothing. I will come on to that later in my speech and, uh, and I thank Dr. Elaine Smith for that intervention. I think the haste with which British planes began bombing Syria mere hours after the Commons vote was carried demonstrates a desire to be seen to be amongst the big boys and play to delusions of grandeur rather than offer any credible solution 
to the problems that exist in Syria or elsewhere. The crisis in Syria has resulted in a large number of people having no choice but to leave their homes, with countless millions displaced in the country itself and millions having fled to neighbouring countries such as Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey. In the case of Lebanon, one in four of the population are now refugees. Brief intervention. Sandra White. Intervention and apologies, I won't be able to stay as I'm hosting the event for Syrian refugees. But can the, the member join with me in welcoming the many Syrian refugees which, who are now in Scotland? Other parts mm -hmm. later in my speech that I will cover. At home, we have seen the local authorities across Scotland, including in central Scotland, have been preparing to welcome Syrian refugees. Indeed, amongst the first of those refugees were a group of 12 families now settling into their new lives in Monklands area of North Lanarkshire. It is unfortunate that a small minority in our society have displayed intolerant views towards those refugees, as well as existing Muslim communities in Scotland in response to this situation. And I am sure that everyone across this chamber, regardless of their views on airstrikes, will join me in condemning the rise of Islamic phobic attacks and in the use of bigoted, sectarian and racist language. I am certain that the vast majority of people in Scotland will extend a warm welcome to those arriving from such hellish conditions. I believe our greatest weapon in the fight against Daesh and our efforts to stop further radicalisation is humanitarian aid. We must put humanitarianism at the forefront of our effort to support the Syrian people rather than bombs. Bombs will create more refugees, more civilian casualties and ultimately result in more recruits becoming radicalised both at home and in the territories controlled by Daesh. Presiding officer, I must highlight the incredible demonstrations that have been taking place across Scotland, in Glasgow, in Edinburgh, outside this parliament and across Scotland and the UK, people have been saying, don't bomb Syria. It is clear to me from conversations that I have had, from emails I've received and from the demonstrations we have seen that people across the country don't support this action and I was pleased to see that the overwhelming majority of Scottish MPs voted against the UK Government's motion. And I'm also pleased to see the members across this chamber, Green, Independent, SNP and Labour, have supported my motion and allowed this debate to take place. Finally, Presiding Officer, I feel the decision to embark on military action should always be the last resort. I don't believe that it is what is happening here. We have failed to learn glaring lessons from previous military actions in the region. The UK Government has been determined to take us into action in Syria for the last two years. First they wanted to bomb Assad, now they target Daesh. In the rush to war, there is no proper strategy to end the game. I fear that this action will only strengthen the grip of terrorists on the region and increase the suffering of ordinary Syrians, and I utterly condemn it. I look forward to the Minister's response and will listen carefully to what action the Scottish Government will be taking to mitigate against the ongoing crisis in Syria. During the Iraq war, the slogan adopted by those campaigning against the war was not in our name. I would like to say today, and put on record, the bombings in Syria by the UK Government are not in my name and hopefully in yours. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, very tight for time today. Four minute speeches up to uh, call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you very much, President Officer. And can I thank uh, John Wilson for bringing this debate to our chamber? A very timely debate as we all break for Christmas and think about time with our families and our children. Maybe we should reflect a bit on some of the children who are facing hardship in this world. Presiding Officer, UNICEF say that Syria is now one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a child. And they are now in the midst of winter. 7.5 million Syrian children inside and outside of that country are in need of humanitarian aid. 2.6 million children no longer in school. Two million live in in refugee camps around Syria. Some children under the age of five know nothing other than a war zone, know nothing other than fleeing across land and sea from those war zones, and know nothing other than life in a refugee camp. For some, long journeys across land and sea take their childhood, 
And for many, many children, it takes their lives. Presiding officer, I'm very, very concerned about the worrying language, and language developing. We are conflating the security of our nations with the Syrian refugee crisis, I believe is a dangerous and disturbing move. The bombs that are used in the airstrikes of which John Wilson spoke about are called brimstones. Now, for me, brimstone is sulphur. It's a chemical compound that we use in fires. It's got a definition in the dictionary of hell's fire. Each of these bombs cost £100,000 each. Calling them smart bombs doesn't make them sexy or palatable for me at all. So these young people that I speak of either flee hell's fire or die in hell's fire from what we see every day when we see those bombers going out to do that job. And what do we hear from the supporters of war? We hear collateral damage. Well, when they say collateral damage, I say men, women, children, homes, Kabani, Yasidis. That's what I see and hear when they say collateral damage. And such dehumanisation of people will be the catalyst, I believe, for generations of radicalised young people with no other outlet for that fear and intimidation. I do not believe the case for a diplomatic intervention has been taken forward. I don't believe it's been advanced at all by the UK government. And I believe it is something they should be advancing in all areas. Bombing will never bring a resolution to this problem. Whether it's dodgy dossiers, like the Prime Minister's 70,000 ground troops, which turns to dust in his hands under any scrutiny whatsoever, ever. And airstrikes, as many have said, do not help the situation, but they certainly do not hinder Daesh. Presiding officer, there's an exhibition by a photographer who spent some time with children fleeing those war zones. His name is Magnus Wemmon, and I'll read one of his extracts. Shehid used to be playful. She especially loved to draw, but her mother soon noticed a common theme in her sketches, weapons. She saw them all the time. That family are now living on the Hungarian border. They pick food from nearby trees. The family said if they had known how difficult it would be to make that journey, they would have risked their lives in Syria. I say, not in my name, not in our Parliament's name, and certainly not in my country's name. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now, Colonel Malcolm Chisholm, to be followed by Jamie McGregor. Up sir, to four can, minutes, um, please. Uh, I congratulate um, the um, member for bringing forward uh, this motion and, and support the thrust of it. But I think each potential war situation must, is unique and must be looked at uh, on its own merits. And my own view is that war is uh, always a last resort. And I think I've opposed UK military intervention in uh, nearly every instance that has happened in my adult life. But clearly there are exceptions unless someone is an intimate and an absolute pacifist. And the Second World War is the uh, classic uh, exception that everybody except um, extreme pacifists would uh, accept. So I think we should accept that every situation is different. But equally, we have to uh, accept that the behaviour of Daesh is very comparable to that of the Nazis in terms of their cruel, murderous, and in many cases exterminating behaviour. And I think uh, people throughout the world are understandably appalled by that. And we should remember that the vast majority, uh, overwhelming majority of Muslims are appalled. And not only that, but in fact, the largest number of the victims of Daesh are themselves Muslims. So these are very important messages uh, to get out. So I, I can understand people's emotional reaction uh, to Daesh in terms of wanting to bomb. And I suppose there is also the, the, the issue of self-defence. I think there is a traditional ethical justification for war in terms of self-defence. And that would apply in this situation because of the threat to, to this country uh, from Daesh, whereas it wouldn't have applied, for example, in the Iraq war. So I think we need to look at this situation specifically. It's different from Iraq. For me, it was a much more difficult decision 
than Iraq, and, I, and, and that's why I actually respect those members of my own party who took a different view. But at the end of the day, I opposed and continue to oppose the bombing in Syria. And of course, there are several reasons for that. The first being uh, the one that John Wilson referred to in terms of innocent people being killed. I was very struck by a tweet that um, Christina McKelvey did the other day saying that life expectancy in Syria in 2010 was 75.9 years and in 2015 is 55.7 years. So uh, there are too many people being killed in Syria already. But again, we have to realize that uh, many of those people, of course, are being killed by uh, Daesh rather than by the bombs of Britain. And of course, many other countries, because I suppose another factor is that the British contribution to bombing actually is not changing the situation very much. But crucially, of course, the British and other bombs are not in themselves going to change the situation on the ground. And that's why a lot of the debate over the last month or so has been about that uh, precisely. Uh, the reality is there is no credible ground force uh, to take back land held by Daesh and therefore uh, bombing is strategically not uh, effective. I, I myself tweeted an article this morning, the, the title of which was, don't rely on Syria's moderate fighting force, it doesn't uh, exist. So I think we have to look at these strategic uh, realities. And then, of course, there is the consideration about the consequences for ourselves. We're already a target, but clearly this is going to make us more of a target. That cannot be the overriding argument against bombing, but it is something that we have to take into account. So we have to look at the alternatives because there is no option of doing nothing. Daesh have to be taken on and they have to be defeated for the sake of the people who live in the Middle East most of all, but also for our own sakes in terms of self-defense. So clearly there are a range of measures in terms of cutting off funding, oil revenues, arms supplies and so on. And getting involved as far as possible in the negotiation process because ultimately there has to be a negotiated settlement and part of the problem of course is the complexity of the situation uh, in Syria and so many of the fight forces fighting Daesh are also fighting each other so it's an incredibly complex situation but bombing Syria cannot be the answer to it and finally we have to say something about the refugees uh, firstly because we have to do everything that we can to support and welcome these refugees but secondly we George, must close, counter the views of those who are connecting that issue with the issue of terrorism. Let's welcome the refugees and do everything positive we can to resolve the situation in Syria. Thank you so much. We now call on Jamie McGregor to be followed by John Finney. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I firstly would like to congratulate John Wilson on securing time in Parliament for this important debate. And I also entirely agree with his remarks concerning Islamophobia and the need to put a stop to it. Um, it is with a very heavy heart, though, that I take part in this debate, as it is yet another sign of the current instability of our world, a world filled with conflict and atrocities. Every wasted life is a tragedy. There's no doubt about that. In all conflicts where we are taking part, we should continue to do all we can to minimize civilians, civilian casualties and I do have the highest confidence in that our servicemen and women are doing all they can to ensure that outcome. But the recent vote in the House of Commons on the UK stepping up its involvement in Syria was important for a number of reasons. First, we are sending a clear and unequivocal message of support to our brothers and sisters in France, showing that Britain is a partner you can rely on regardless of circumstance. We must do all we can to ensure that the nightmare of Paris is not repeated, not in Paris and nowhere else. Secondly, the Islamic State Daesh has proven yet again that their striking capabilities are good. This is not a petty gang of thugs in a faraway land. This is an organization well versed in spreading terror and death wherever they go. If we fail to stop them, we do not only fail to keep the people of Britain safe, we also fail the people of the region that has to suffer the heavy hand of Daesh. Homosexuals thrown off rooftops, invaluable cultural treasures destroyed, people burnt alive and beheaded for their beliefs. These are people that don't want to negotiate and finding a diplomatic solution with Daesh is very probably not possible. And that is very, very regrettable. Presiding officer, it is not common to hear a Conservative directly quoting a Labour shadow foreign secretary out of agreement, 
but I shall do my best to do justice to Hilary Bren's excellent speech in support of our intervention. His analysis of our enemy was very poignant. He said, we are faced by fascists, not just their calculated brutality, but their belief that they are superior to every single one of us in this chamber tonight and all the people we represent. They hold us in contempt. They hold our values in contempt. They hold our belief in tolerance and decency in contempt. And he's right. Daesh despises all that we stand for. However, that in itself does not warrant airstrikes. But all they seek to, not today, not tomorrow, but as soon as they can, destroy all that we hold dear. The UK has already been fighting Daesh in Iraq, and we have, alongside our many allies, managed to weaken their foothold in Iraq. Before last week's vote, however, Daesh fighters could just cross the fictional border between Iraq and Syria to seek cover. This safe haven no longer exists for them. Britain was asked by the world community to act. We have heeded the call for aid. Britain again stands shoulder to shoulder with our allies, fellow champions of freedom, and against a common enemy. We now have to ensure that our airstrikes are conducted in a manner that is as efficient as possible, using strategies developed to minimize civilian casualties, getting adequate intelligence from the ground, allowing for precision pinpointed strikes is absolutely essential. With a comprehensive strategy and with strong backing of the UN, both of which we currently have, we stand a good chance to defeat these evil forces that seek to destroy us, embodied by Daesh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I call on John Finney to be followed by Willie Coffey. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I too congratulate John Wilson on bringing this very pertinent motion uh, and giving us all the opportunity to discuss it. The motion talks about bombing uh, densely populated areas, and we know that after the Second World War, the first location where that happened was in uh, Chechnya, where Russia uh, carpet bombed uh, Grozny. And they did so, as I think history will show, with the compliance of the West, and that was part of a, a deal that links in with another phrase from the motion, which is about Western military action in the Middle East. And we know that there's ample precedent for that. I would like to talk about a couple, and that is Iraq. Uh, we went there on a, a false premise, and if we could, and I suggest we don't, set aside the obscene levels of death there, uh, did we achieve our aims? Indeed, what were our aims? Libya is another example, uh, and people will remember the deal in the desert. And again, if we could set aside these obscene levels of death, uh, and I suggest we don't, uh, have we achieved our aims? What were these aims? Well, what we have done is we've delivered anarchy to both these countries. Now, no one doubts for one minute, and I'm no, no different, that an obligation placed in the United Kingdom to protect its citizens. How you do that is you assess the risks and you put in place mechanisms to deal with these risks. There's none of the assessed risks that the UK faces, which are the same as every Western liberal democracy, are about continuity of energy, food, cyber attack, terrorism, these sort of things, which are going to be addressed by bombing anywhere. Um, and language, of course, is very important. Uh, so I think, uh, as with everything, we need to ask ourselves whose interests are being served by any particular action. And I would suggest that it's not always the nation state. It very, very frequently is the arms industry. And how depressing that a senior UK politician talks about getting their mojo back. Well, whatever a mojo is, if that's what gets it back, killing and mindlessly uh, um, uh, inflicting violence in another country, then Again, not in our name. But of course, what we do know is that munitions made 30 miles from here have contributed to death in the Middle East, the killing in the Yemen. And the role that Saudi Arabia plays in that is a vile, obscene regime. And everything that's said about Daesh could be absolutely replicated in respect of that. And again, back to the language, we're told that the West is very keen to see democracy. But of course, we know that when it comes to Palestine or Egypt, that that's not necessarily the case. Likewise, who determines who the goodies and the baddies were? I have to say I have the highest regard for our Kurdish sisters and brothers, the largest dispossessed nation in the world, but a nation that the West wasn't interested on when Saddam Hussein gassed them. Now they're, now they're back on side. But, of course, there are all sorts of conflicts, and these conflicts will relate to NATO's involvement, the role of uh, Turkey. And, of course, Turkey is seizing its opportunity to attack our Kurdish brothers and sisters. I wonder if it's a good thing for a country to have oil, or a bad thing. 
would help South Sudan or Myanmar and their uh, minority populations who were being abused there if they did or didn't have oil. Um, I think uh, we need to be alert to all the, the dangers that are associated with this conflict. I, as ever, prefer tanks, not tornadoes. I'm concerned that we fuel it by our investment, and I include, yes, I'll repeat it again, the investment in the arms trade of the Scottish Parliamentary Pension Scheme. I have to say, I guess again, the impression the United Kingdom likes war. Um, um, I don't like war. I like the role that the Scottish Government will play in conflict resolution. Uh, I don't like the demonisation of people who oppose violence. I'll oppose violence from every quarter. I want adherence to international law. I want respect for human rights. And I want a one world, one humanity. Um, I don't want a piece of the action. The action I want a piece of is showing compassion to our Syrian refugees. So, fortunate Ladunia to everyone that's coming to the Isle of Butte. And thank you very much for signing up, sir. Thank you very much. And I now call on Willie Coffey to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thanks very much, President Officer, and thanks also to John Wilson for bringing the issue of the decision of the, by the UK Government to launch airstrikes in Syria to the attention of the Scottish Parliament in this debate. Um, Syria was a country of 23 million people before this conflict began. I say it was because Syria seems to be a country no more. It lies in ruins, its infrastructures in tatters, schools, hospitals, towns, villages in rubble. Four million UN registered refugees abroad another million unregistered, seven million displaced internally, and over a quarter of a million of its citizens are dead. Basically, half its population is displaced in one form or another. We're witnessing the death of a nation in front of our eyes, and its people are fleeing, having lost all hope for peace. They flee their own government, from the rebels fighting that government, from Daesh IS fighting everybody, and from the combined airstrikes targeting all of them. The Russians target the rebels and Daesh, the West targets Daesh and the regime and helps the rebels. The West asks the Russians to stop targeting the rebels since it lets IS and the regime off the hook. Assad says the Russian intervention is more effective, but he would, wouldn't he? What an absolute disaster has been created, and no wonder that once proud country is literally bleeding to death. All of this, presiding officer, was known to us before the UK decided to pitch in with its contribution of more airstrikes. And surely any reasonable person must be asking whether the UK military involvement, which started only minutes after the vote for action, is helping or making things worse. The House of Commons didn't authorise a plan for peace. It authorised a plan for war. Have we learned nothing from the past and glorious adventure in Iraq, where the country was told a pack of lies to make it easier for a Prime Minister to side up with the American military campaign there? There was no plan for peace then, and there's none now. What disturbs me is the glib claim by the UK Defence Minister that there are no reports of civilian casualties. How reassuring. No wonder there are no reports. There are no reporters. Mercifully, though, what we do have is a citizen's journalist social media presence through Twitter feeds and Facebook from a group called RBSS, which means Raqqa is being silently slaughtered. It's a social media platform of underground citizens who try to report what's happening in Raqqa. They report on IS crucifixions, beheadings, sexual abuse, and some of their members have even been murdered by IS. They describe Raqqa as it was, though, a wonderful city with its universities, its cafes, its bars, rich in energy resources and a solid agricultural base, and which became a focal point for the rebellion against Assad. It's now a stronghold for Daesh, attracting more and more fighters from abroad to live in this so-called caliphate. They describe it now, though, as a prison where women are not permitted to leave and its citizens are basically human shields against airstrikes. Many local people have joined IS through fear and youngsters have been forced into training camps to be indoctrinated. And of the airstrikes, the RBS is, say the bombing strategy is plainly stupid. The West bombing the outskirts, the Russians allegedly hitting a hospital and a university, while the people are trapped inside the city. People are afraid that their city is simply being bombed into oblivion, just like Kobani. Even military commentators say IS can't be defeated there unless it's on the ground. RBSS feel the only way they can rebuild Syria is through the civic society growing and spreading, countering and destroying IS propaganda and social media. It's crucial in achieving this, and they need help to continue with that. President officer, are we closer or further away 
from a solution by sending an RAF planes to rain more bombs down in Raqqa. I fear we may be further away, and these brave citizens of Raqqa seem to think that too. While the West and Russia have different aims in Syria, and IS holds the city of Raqqa and its citizens to ransom, there doesn't look to, close, me to be any prospect for peace. A bombing campaign in its own can't succeed. Surely it has to be within our wit to devise an intelligent and coordinated campaign to nullify IS and its propaganda and to embrace the civic rebellion that has sprung up in the hope that somebody somewhere will listen and act to protect and cherish the citizens of Raqqa and to work for the restoration of this nation of Syria. Once again, congratulations to John Wilson for bringing us this debate. Thank you. Many thanks. I call on Neil Friendly to be followed by Jean Urquhart. Okay, thanks very much, President Officer. <coughs> and I too uh, congratulate John Wilson in bringing this forward. Um, I think there's been really good contributions uh, today. Uh, um, I have had feared, um, watching some of the debate around this issue, that we might follow some of what has been said elsewhere. And I think I'm, I'm really pleased that's not happened because people who present this as being the good guys don't want to bomb and it's the bad guys who do, I think, do their case, uh, whichever side they're on, no credit uh, whatsoever. Um, that kind of argument without any nuance or recognition of the complexity of the situation, I think, weakens the argument against uh, uh, bombing considerably and it certainly does not bolster it. But I, I am absolutely clear in my opposition to the bombing of Syria. I do not do that as a, a pacifist or an appeaser. I do so because my view of a very complex situation, and I think Willie Coffey explained the complexity at the beginning of his, his speech very well, uh, my view of that complex situation is pretty straightforward. I think in a, a situation where we have a long protracted, uh, devastating civil war that's reduced the a proud, sophisticated, cultured, developed country to one big pile of tragic rubble, uh, and where Daesh, ISIL, ISIS, whatever title they operate under, are engaged in nihilistic barbarism and brutality. Do we assist that situation? Do we make that situation better or worse by sending in airplanes to join in the thunderstorm of bombs raining down on that land? Well, airstrikes de-radicalise, de-escalate an already appalling situation or will it escalate it further and will further radicalise those who have nothing left to lose? Will creating more Syrian orphans and widows hasten the end of the civil war? Will the demolition of more homes and factories and infrastructure and what remains of civic society help prevent French citizens from killing French citizens in the concert halls of Paris? Will the inevitable collateral damage, in other words, the deaths of more innocent people, prevent otherwise respectable US citizens living in suburban America from stockpiling weapons, then going to a Christmas party and wiping out dozens of people? I just cannot see how it will. And the reality is that since 9-11 we have had the war on terror unleashed following those horrendous events uh, in 9-11. Has that brought an end to terrorism, or has it stoked the flames of it further? The war on terror, far from making the world a safer place, has made it a much, much more dangerous one. Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and now Syria. I have to ask, what have we learned? It would appear not very much. The desire to do something doesn't mean we just do anything. And the reality is, in an age of spectacularly advanced technology and modern communications, you cannot bomb your way to a victory over terrorists like Daesh, who are operating in a cell structure. Um, where are they based? Who knows? Where do they live? Who knows? Who are they? Well, who knows? And as we've seen in the past in events like Glasgow, uh, the Glasgow airport bombing, they are in fact doctors and teachers and accountants and IT consultants. They're people doing normal, everyday jobs. So dealing with that type of threat will never be ended through military hardware. It has to be dealt with through cutting off funding, cutting off propaganda, communications, through education and through ending the civil war in Syria and conflicts across the Middle East, which stoke up that resentment and that feeling of helplessness. President officer, I'll finish on a more upbeat 
uh, point. Hopefully Today, two lorries um, will leave, uh, will come to Livingston and collect donations that my local Labour Party collected for uh, Syria. Um, that will send hundreds of boxes to uh, help the refugees in Germany. And I'm very proud please. that we did that. The response from the public in West Lothian was huge. President officer, I don't pretend to have any answers, but one thing I do know is that bombing is not the solution. Thanks so much. Now call on Jean Urquhart, after which move the closing speech from the Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I would uh, also like to congratulate John Wilson for bringing uh, a very timely topic and subject for debate in this Parliament. And I'm only sorry that there are not uh, perhaps more people who see this possibly as one of the most uh, important debates to be, to be held here. Um, my, my question really, and I, I agree with, with almost everything I've heard, um, very powerful and uh, speeches, and, and uh, I can't really add to any of that, but what I do want to talk about is the fact that the seriousness of war and the lack of uh, coverage in our media we know exactly what's, what these bombs are capable of because we can find out for ourselves. But we're not, I think, uh, showing, and we never do, the, the, the harshness of war. It's been described very well in this parliament to the few people who are hearing it now, and it will be in the parliamentary report. But it seems to me that Scotland is a nation, and although... Uh, defence and uh, military matters are, are still reserved to, to Westminster. There was no doubt, presiding officer, absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the representatives of the, through the democratic process of the people of this country voted against bombing in Syria. And I think that should have been a headline repeated and repeated and repeated. And no, not in my name. And as Christina McKelvey said, not in our country's name was this excusable. We knew what, what was going to happen. It, it was, it, it's no surprise that, it will, that we know that it won't fix anything. It didn't fix it before and it won't fix it now. And to put the hand of hum, on humanitarian aid, starting perhaps in this country, the obscenity of a bomb costing £100,000 is the obscenity of thousands of people with no food in this country. And a genuine desire for, to, to help Syrian people as refugees now. Why, why are we allowing this to happen? And how, I would ask our minister and our government and all of the members of this parliament, how do we get that message now into a press that is supporting the arms race, that is supporting uh, not the, the 78 people who, who uh, the 78 percent of people in this country that recent polls show are opposed to the bombing uh, in Syria, but reflecting that, reflecting the nationhood of this country and the, the people's desire not to have bombed in Syria, how do we now have that expressed? And how does Westminster react to that when a country clearly has objected and wants to take no part in the war? So yes, I do, I welcome uh, John Wilson's uh, debate today, but I think the debate isn't over, and we really should be taking this, uh, making our voice heard in a much stronger fashion, because if we can do it in Syria, we'll do it the next time. We will not learn, and we will constantly be carried along by a Westminster military machine that is not reflecting the will of the Scottish people. Thanks so much. I now call the Minister Humsi Yousaf to close the debate on behalf of the Government the seven minutes are thereby. Please, Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. My thanks to John Wilson for bringing this debate to the Chamber, and thanks to the members, all of the members that have contributed to what I think was a very uh, thoughtful uh, debate uh, indeed. Uh, Presiding Officer, the crisis in Syria is one of the worst humanitarian disasters of recent times. The scale of the suffering uh, unimaginable. We've heard some of those figures, some of the numbers. Uh, that have been mentioned of those that have lost their lives and been displaced already. Uh, it's important to remember, of course, Presiding Officer, that the situation in Syria is not a new one. It's not a recent uh, event. Uh, the 
conflict in Syria, uh, the bombardment by the regime on their own people has been happening for four uh, and a half years of a brutal uh, civil war. Uh, the recent attacks in Paris, Beirut, uh, Istanbul and elsewhere, elsewhere around the world inevitably uh, uh, make us ask ourselves, what can we do uh, to respond? How can we keep ourselves safe? Uh, on that point, I would say two things. I would say I would agree with uh, Neil Finlay's uh, assessment that uh, you, you, we can't do something for the sake of it. You know, doing something doesn't mean uh, doing anything. I think that was a phrase uh, he used. It's certainly one uh, I would agree with. The second point I would make on that was going back to Jamie McGregor's contribution, uh, which I thought was a very, very, very thoughtful contribution, actually, although I disagreed with, with many parts of it. Very thoughtful uh, indeed. But he made the point that um, there, was a, th there was an obligation on the UK to respond to the call from our allies, in this case, uh, in France. And what I would say is that uh, the Scottish Government's uh, relationship with France and with our allies is as strong as uh, we'd want it to be, and of course we always look to strengthen it. But that relationship of strengthening uh, with our allies should not be uh, based on simply acceding to demands or requests without any critical analysis. Um, there should always be, uh, we should always be prepared to listen to requests of our allies. Uh, but of course that relationship should be one that's built on, on mutual respect. Uh, in the same way that the relationship between France and the UK is as strong as it ever has been, despite the fact that France uh, did not listen, uh, did not uh, accede to the calls uh, of the UK and the US to get involved in Iraq, for example. So you can have a different foreign policy, you can make different decisions. I don't think it's right to characterise that, uh, which in fairness I know Jamie McGregor wasn't, uh, but as others have done, uh, is simply not standing up for our allies. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, is not opposed to military intervention simply uh, as a matter of, of principle uh, and within itself, uh, as Elaine Smith uh, MSP had said before uh, that uh, those that opposed airstrikes uh, simply don't, uh, uh, don't believe that nothing uh, should be done uh, whatever. But as members across the chamber have said, uh, any action can only be undertaken when it's legal, of course, when there's a clear objective in mind and when it's part of a wider coherent strategy to achieve peace. Uh, the solution proposed by the UK government to broaden airstrikes to include targets in Syria does not address uh, the root causes of either the war in Syria or indeed the terrorism that has affected so many other countries. Indeed, as many members of the Chamber have said, there's a risk that it makes those two factors worse. Uh, despite being asked time and time again to explain what the strategy is during that House of Commons uh, debate, I feel the, and the Scottish Government feels the Prime Minister failed to make a convincing case that airstrikes in Syria would help to end violence uh, or undermine extremism. For example, a very simple question that was asked time and time again by MPs in the House of Commons was how will UK efforts uh, help defeat Daesh where 11 other countries, including three members, uh, permanent members of the UN Security Council have failed. Uh, indeed, the fact that the Prime Minister asked Parliament for permission to bomb the Assad regime in 2013 only to return two years later to ask permission to bomb Daesh perhaps speaks about the lack of coherent long-term planning uh, that exists. Uh, furthermore, we have rightly, as others have done, pushed the UK government to provide more detail of that number, that 70,000 so-called moderate forces uh, who would no doubt take over, controls that, uh, take over uh, control of areas that have been vacated uh, by Daesh. Very many respected MPs from across the political spectrum and security experts have cast doubt uh, on that figure and the answers given by the Prime Minister. I want to touch upon uh, the refugee issue that has been mentioned by a number of members. I think Christina McKelvey spoke particularly powerful about um, how some children uh, won't know anything other than a refugee camp in their uh, entire life. And she spoke very uh, powerfully uh, about that, uh, presiding officer. Everyone understands that uh, there cannot be a military solution to the conflict uh, in Syria. We know it requires, of course, a diplomatic effort to, to, to find an end to that conflict. But in the meantime, we must uh, continue to offer any assistance that we possibly can uh, to refugees. I've been overwhelmed by the response uh, that Scotland has shown right up and down uh, the country by local authorities, but then by people uh, looking to help refugees in any way that they possibly can. I'm proud of the uh, Scottish Government for leading that call, not just this year, but actually for many years, uh, to say that uh, refugees must be welcomed uh, here from Syria. It's unacceptable that we have uh, four to five million, actually closer to five million now, uh, re Syrian refugees uh, living in camps. Uh, we must help the most vulnerable. And from a Scottish Government's perspective, we've given £500,000 in terms of funding to help the situation in Syria. We have taken almost 
40% of the entire intake of refugees that have come uh, pre-Christmas. And I think we should continue to push the UK government to do more. Uh, that 20,000 figure over the parliamentary term is not enough. Uh, a good start would be to opt in to the European uh, scheme and take more refugees. In terms of uh, Jean Arkett's question uh, and, and, and also uh, John Finney and many others about what the Scottish Government can do, where can the focus be, what action uh, John Wilson asked uh, can the Scottish Government take, uh, we must, uh, from our perspective, uh, be willing to assist in any way that we possibly can to help to build peace and to, to help the situation in Syria when there is a diplomatic solution. And there will be a diplomatic solution. Nobody knows exactly when. The peace talks are still going on, but there will be. But we have to ensure the conditions are, are, are right for when that negotiation, when that settlement uh, comes to be. And, and in terms of the Scottish Government, uh, we uh, and the First Minister have recently announced the Scottish Government will be working with the UN uh, Special Envoy to Syria, Stefan de Mistra, uh, to provide training for women in the skills needed to contribute to the forthcoming peace negotiations. And I was in that meeting with uh, the UN Special Envoy and he made the very important point that in 30 years plus of conflict resolution that he has, women are the key to finding peace. Uh, he believed that very sincerely and gave very thoughtful uh, reason for why what that was the case. Not as a tick box exercise, but actually how fundamentally uh, helping to train women uh, could come about bringing peace uh, when a, a diplomatic solution uh, is found. But in conclusion, uh, presiding uh, officer, uh, I think it does uh, no one any good to characterise each other as the good or the bad guys, depending on how they chose to, to, to how they chose to vote in the House of Commons debate or indeed what position uh, they take uh, in this chamber. I think that uh, decision to extend airstrikes was a very difficult one, I'm sure, even for the Prime Minister. Uh, I think many of us had sleepless nights over that decision. But that decision has been taken. As Jean Arkett said, we must continue to make the case about why uh, there actually is not a military solution and redouble the diplomatic effort. But in the meantime, as that violence continues, unfortunately, then the one thing we can do is, or the things that we can do are contribute to that peace, but also continue to give the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable a home here in Scotland. And I join with other members across the chamber who have already said that refugees most certainly uh, are welcome here. Thank you very much. And thank you all for taking part in this important debate. I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30 this afternoon. <laughs>